In this episode of the Ben Greenfield Fitness Show, holiday fat loss tips. The best way to lose belly fat. Does ketosis increase your metabolic rate? Fasted morning walks and much more. He's an expert in human performance and nutrition. Voted America's top personal trainer and one of the globe's most influential people in health and fitness. His show provides you with everything you need to optimize physical and mental performance. He is Ben Greenfield. Power. Speed. Mobility. Balance. Whatever it is for you that's the natural movement. Get out there. When you look at all the studies done, studies that have shown the greatest efficacy. All the information you need in one place. Right here, right now on the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Brock, I can't stop burping this morning. I don't know why. Yes, we just unearthed the fact that you've been drinking root beer. I burped like four times before we started recording. I actually did... You you nailed it. Well, nothing. I don't know makes... if you have a hidden camera in my home, but I <laughs> I, mm. I had a, a craving this morning for for Zevia, uh, you know, a sparkling stevia flavored soda. They I, have yeah, a uh, that stuff. they have a ginger root beer, and for some reason this morning I wanted to have a ginger root beer and I drank one, and now I'm realizing like root beer and podcasting do not go hand in hand. No, wow. nothing makes you belch like root beer. And I, I, we really should do a whole podcast on that because, like, what is the mechanism of action there? Mm, I don't know, but I'll, I can tell you one thing. That stuff makes a darn tasty root beer float. You get, like, this uh, vanilla, you know, we're, we're a fan of coconut ice cream here at the Greenfield household mm. uh, because we find cows to be sacred. We actually worship cows here, so we don't, we I, don't I've drink seen milk. I've seen your Instagram feed where you're all like yeah. bowing before the cow. Yeah. Yeah. But we slaughter coconuts. Mm-hmm. We, sl- we will we'll eat the heck out of coconuts. So we do a coconut uh, vanilla ice cream and you just put that in a glass and you pour some ginger root beer over it. Oh, my goodness. But it's not it's it's not quite holiday. Um, not really. No, it's more of a summertime thing, really. And we're we're into at least in the northern hemisphere here. We're into the winter holidays. Hence today's podcast for you guys. We're going to be talking all about holiday fat loss, uh, starting right off with the news flashes. So I figure we should just uh, we should just forsake the ginger root beer and jump right into into busting the belly fat. What do you think, Brock? Let's do it. Let's get rid of all that turkey we ate last week. News flashes. All right, dude. Well, speaking of of all that turkey that we ate last week, uh, I can still smell it. Although I'm Canadian, we had Thanksgiving like a month and a half ago, so I'm just pretending. Well, I shot a turkey, so nice. there's that. I, I bow Take hunted that a turkey. turkey. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I both bow hunted a turkey and got a fantastic turkey from from uh, this uh, these these folks over at U.S. Wellness Meats. Bless your heart, John, over at U.S. Wellness Meats for sending me an. 18 pound turkey because my wife did not believe that I was actually going to go out and shoot a turkey. But I did. Uh, 18 I snuck pounds. Up in my I snagged a turkey at 35 yards with my bow nice. and uh, yeah, de feathered right, it and right opened through it the up eye. and field dressed it and took it home and cooked it up. It's good stuff. Uh, anyways, anyway. though, uh, we are at the time of year when people binge. And so I wanted to point out this fantastic uh, article from our friends over at Examine. Exactly. And as usual, anything that you hear me talk about, you can go over to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 376, and we'll put all the links to all these studies. But what they wanted to investigate was whether or not binging, like we do over the holidays, at least some of us do, uh, whether binging can have an effect on your fat stores. And if so, how much? Hmm. What was really interesting, they did this three-month study where they took a whole bunch of twins. They found 12 sets of twins, uh, and they decided 
that they were going to feed them enough calories to cause a 35 pound weight increase. So they just kind of approximated them, I guess would be, yeah, I guess, I guess what they did was, you know, if a pound of fat is 3,500 calories, theoretically, they would have given them what, like 35,000 extra calories. So no, no, actually more than that, more than that. Yeah. That would only be, over a three month study to cause a 35 pound increase. Yeah. Oh, a man. lot, a lot more. Than that. So, that is um, force feeding. They're force feeding the twins. Yeah. And so within a pair, they gained similar weight, the twins, did, which makes sense because they got the same genetics. Uh, but, uh, between the pairs of twins, the variability was through the roof. Like one pair gained 10 pounds, another pair gained 30 pounds, another pair, I uh, gained 35. It was just all over the map. Hmm. And so it appears that genetics play a pretty big role in determining how much weight you gain, uh, especially when it comes to overfeeding. But of course, very few of us are eating uh, for a three month holiday. Most of us are just like, you know, whatever, after Thanksgiving or on Christmas Day. And so the question is, is that going to cause you to gain fat? Well, the idea is that they looked into the studies on this over at Examine. And it turns out that many of those extra calories, most of them, in fact, they eat over the holidays, they either get burnt off as heat, hence those meat night sweats that you get. <laughs> yeah, if you, you wake meal. up all sweaty and plastered to your sheets. A whole bunch of them wind up in the crapper mm-hmm. uh, and just go Thank through goodness. you as, as dung. Mm. Um, dung. And, and by the way, by the way, not not to sound all bulimic or whatever, but a, a coffee enema can actually help that that process out quite a bit if you did that after a binge. Uh, and Wait, then a how, whole how so? Like you're still making the same amount of it, poop. You're just well, like it induces it, come out. it induces peristalsis. Yeah, yeah, so it makes it a little bit more comfortable. Exactly, okay. you're yeah. not going to like make more poop. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other thing is that to store the carbs that you ingest, which you typically ingest more of on the holidays, uh, your body has to transform the carbs into glycogen. And then attach that glycogen to water molecules. And there's about three to four grams of water per gram of glycogen. So you may find when you weigh yourself the next day that you weigh a whole lot more than you did before you binged. But it turns out that a huge part of that is water weight. Water so weight. Ultimately, uh, you can binge. You're going to gain some weight. Most of it is water weight. Very little of it is fat. Uh, and uh, in addition to water, a lot of it is just soon to be poop. Mm-hmm. So um, it, it really turns out the main thing that you need to worry about of everything on the holidays when it, come to, when it comes to fat storage and effects on your microbiome and effects on your hormones and effects on your belly fat, which we'll talk about later, uh, is uh, what do you think, Brock? The protein, the carbs, the fats? I'm going to say fat? it's consistency. Like, mm-hmm. And I don't mean like how smooth your meal is. I mean like how often you're, you're binging, not just the single binge. It's actually alcohol. Oh. Alcohol of, of so all. So I was way of, off. You were way off. <laughs> I don't think I even understood uh, the question I was so far off. Yeah, okay, because your body so readily burns alcohol for energy to avoid the toxicity effect mm-hmm. of alcohol that didn't, uh, it dampens the oxidation of fat. It dampens the oxidation of protein and carbohydrates. It increases your appetite in the short term, it decreases the propensity of your body to produce hormones that cause fat loss and it increases inflammation, which shuts down the ability, the the ability of um, of adipose tissue to release its fatty acids. So it turns out if there's anything that you're going to moderate during a binge, um, it would be uh, alcohol. So chalk one up to that, that root beer stevia. There you go. So drink some of that. Actually, either you have to moderate it or you drink so much that you actually like purge. Yeah. Or have some, what do they call it? Oduls. Oduls. Yeah. I mean, the alcohol free swill. Yeah. Yeah. There's never an excuse for that. (laughs) I've been cutting my wine with uh, just like organic apple cider vinegar as like a digestif. It's actually pretty good. It's like this little cocktail I make. I do like half as much wine as I normally have. And I have it over ice, which I know just bastardizes the wine anyways. But then I put a little bit of apple cider vinegar and a pinch of sea salt in there. And that's like the cocktail I've been having before dinner. I I don't even know what to say to that. Yeah, it's not going to win any flavor competition. Yeah, I kind of want to reach to the microphone and give you a slap. But I also kind of want to shake your hand. I'm not, I'm torn. 
It's good. Apple cider vinegar is good stuff. All right, we better get, keep going through these. Yeah, let's keep going. Okay, We're here all day. Woo. All right, so so here's another one for the holidays. Uh, a couple of new studies on uh, something that's that's super sexy these days: <laughs> walking. It's so everybody hot wants right to talk now. about walking. Yeah, it's so hot right now. So it turns out that uh, walking uh, and the timing of when you walk in conjunction to a meal is actually important. Hmm. It turns out that, as, as we all know, you can improve your glucose levels and decrease what's called your glycemic variability by walking uh, during the day. So even though walking doesn't, doesn't really burn that many calories, no. I mean, you could – have you seen the new Google Maps feature where it tells you when you're going to walk somewhere, like how much you're going to burn? No, I haven't. And I remember oh. yeah, I was in Minneapolis a few weeks ago That's... and I was going to walk to Whole Foods. <laughs> okay, so Whole Foods is like freaking – Two and a half miles away from my hotel and two and a half miles back. And it's like 30 degrees out. So I take off. I got my coat on. I'm walking to Whole Foods. And I look down at, at Google Maps and I'm almost to Whole Foods. And it tells me over those two and a half miles, I burnt half of a cupcake. <laughs> and it literally, literally. So it doesn't had, even like, give you a number? It. it gives you. No, not. Yeah, well, no, it gives you the number, and I forget what it was. Oh. You know, it was like 75 calories or something like that, but nothing, you know, basically nothing. However, what it does do, even though you're not burning a lot of calories, what it does or a do lot is of it does a fan- yeah, or a lot of cupcakes, does a fantastic job of lowering your blood sugar, and it turns mm. out that they studied uh, when is the best time that you should walk to actually have the most effectiveness for uh, blood sugar control and even for weight loss in long-term studies. And it turns out that the best time to walk when it comes to a binge or when it comes to eating a lot of food Mm -hmm. or when it comes to walking Mm -hmm. is rather than waiting for an hour to walk after a meal, there is a significantly greater effect on insulin levels, on blood sugar, and on propensity for weight gain if you walk immediately after the meal, hmm. immediately after the meal. So if you're going to walk, you wouldn't, let's say, go to a restaurant, eat a whole bunch of food, and then drive home and walk. You would like park far away and walk to your car. Or if you have a big old Thanksgiving meal, you don't finish the meal and you know roll in a food coma over to the couch and watch the football game. You go for a walk before you watch the football game. So it turns out that re- Repeated hyperglycemia after meals can be controlled. And in this case, uh, this mainstay was looking at about a 30-minute walk. So it turns out the best time to walk is like right after you finish. Nice. That that seems yeah. like it would be really a lot more comfortable to do that too, or a little more comfortable for the rest of the day or the rest of the evening. Because mm-hmm. I, I hate that feeling when you've just got a big bolus of turkey and stuffing and sweet potatoes and marshmallows and everything all piled up in your gut, and all you do is just sit there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good like feeling. Burn coming up in your throat and your yeah. stomach's all sloshy. Yeah, yeah, so get up and go I, for a walk and do something helpful. Maybe go shovel or something. Yeah, again, I'm not like an exercise to eat, eat to exercise kind of guy. I think that's a that's kind of a horrible freight train to get on. Yeah. But at the same time, like doing something to improve the activity of your glucose transporters before a meal, like whatever, it could be like high intensity interval training or weight training. Yeah. Either one works. I could so you could do a, a Tabata set on a bike, or you could go, you know, do some do three sets of ten heavy deadlifts or whatever. But uh, and then after the meal, something aerobic. Nobody wants to deadlift or do a Tabata set on a bike after a huge no, you know, no. binge. But at the same time, going on a walk, easy peasy. Plus, it lets you catch up with the folks sure. on the holidays. Um, okay, so speaking of blood sugar control, fascinating new article on natural alternatives to metformin. Uh, which is a pretty potent blood sugar controlling drug commonly prescribed for diabetes that we've talked about before on the show, both the good and the bad about it. Um, and this article is big and it's kind of a propeller hat type of article. Uh, it's called Towards Natural Mimetics of Metformin and Rap- Rapamycin. So we're talking about things that not only replicate the blood sugar controlling effect of metformin and this this other compound called rapamycin, but also things that mimic the longevity enhancing effect. And uh, one of the things that really caught my attention in this article, and one of the most significant findings of it, was there's this compound called withafarin. Hmm. Withafarin. Withafarin. That's that's what I'd name a princess if I was going to write a book. Withafarin. Hmm. 
with a Farron. Um, okay. Anyways, though, so with a Farron uh, was one of the compounds that topped the list for similarity to both metformin and rapamycin. Many operated on a very uh, similar uh, pathway from a genetic standpoint. Now, what with a Farron is is it's called a lactone, a steroidal lactone, and it's did you say derived. laxative? No, lactone. Oh, okay. Lactone. Gotcha. Yeah, different than laxative. Uh, so a lactone uh, is something we'll commonly find used in Ayurvedic medicine, in traditional Indian medicine, uh, for several different disorders. But it turns out that it's got some pretty potent anti-diabetic and blood sugar controlling effects and may also have some of these longevity enhancing effects that things like metformin and rapamycin do. And do you know what compound is very, very high in this with a farin? I do, but I'm totally cheating because I've got the notes open in front of me. Ashwagandha. ashwagandha. One of my faves. Yeah. yeah, ashwagandha, which is actually, you know what? I, I don't, this isn't usually the time of the show when we do sponsors, but I might as well say this. One of the sponsors for today's show, they actually have a whole bunch of ashwagandha in their stuff. It's the, uh, the Organifi, mm, that green yeah. juice powder, chock full of ashwagandha. And the guy that owns that company, Drew Canola, he's a buddy of mine and he does a really good job sourcing this stuff. And they have some really, really good, high quality ashwagandha in the, uh, they call it the Organifi green juice. So there you have it. There's your, there's your sponsor shout out. You can go to, bengreenfieldfitness.com slash Organifi, Organifi with an I, uh, and that gets you 20% off your your own anti-aging, blood sugar-controlling ashwagandha. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Okay, and speaking of longevity, I, uh, same thing. When I was in Minneapolis, I had a chat with Dr. Thomas Cowan. Super smart dude. He actually wrote this week's article over at bengreenfieldfitness.com where we talked about why modern heart attack remedies fail and why people really have heart attacks. Mm -hmm. Blow your mind if you didn't read that article yet. So go go check that out. It's at bengreenfieldfitness.com. Uh, but Dr. Cowan also has been looking into this concept of deuterium-depleted water. You heard of this stuff before? I have not. Okay. So deuterium is very similar to hydrogen, but it weighs twice as much as hydrogen. It just basically has an extra neutron in it. So that means it's pretty much electrically identical to hydrogen, uh, and it can bind oxygen to form water. So instead of H2O, it'd be D2O. And it's very, very similar to normal water, but it is heavier. They actually call it heavy water hmm. because deuterium weighs more than the H2O. So because it is in water, and it's found naturally in a lot of water, um, it it reaches a certain concentration in your cells when you consume water that has deuterium in it. And what that can cause is when your deuterium levels rise, your, uh, your mitochondria start to function more poorly. Uh, your protein, your DNA folding begins to unravel. It can't be incorporated into cells the same way as regular like H2O water actually is. So, so the ultimate takeaway is that as your deuterium levels go up in the water in your cells, uh, that's the hallmark of an aging and deteriorating body. And so that, that all looks good on paper, but the idea is they actually looked into this. And so they, they took water and they depleted water of all its natural deuterium. So they just took deuterium out of the water. Uh, they did a study in the Journal of Cancer Therapy, and they showed that men with stage 4 prostate cancer, which is not that reversible, um, they had a mean survival time of 11 years compared to an average of 18 to 24 months hmm. when they drank deuterium-depleted water. Wow. Uh, there was another study published in the Journal of Medical Hypotheses in 2016 that showed that a ketogenic diet actually causes fat to generate deuterium-depleted water in the tissue. So you can make your own deuterium-depleted water by being in a state of ketosis. Huh. And uh, the, the other very interesting thing, and I'll link to this article that Dr. Cowan wrote in the show notes over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 376, is that vegetables, particularly green vegetables, have chloroplasts in their leaves. And those chloroplasts uh, excrete deuterium from the plant tissues and leave the water in the plant naturally deuterium depleted. 
So if you're eating an animal that's eaten a diet uh, that, that's like a, a grass-fed diet, that animal will become naturally deuterium depleted. And so you'll get more deuterium depleted water from the animal meat. Uh, you would also, if you eat a high amount of greens and you combine that with something like ketosis, you yourself will be in a deuterium depleted state and lower your risk of things like cancer, for example. Hmm. So it's really fascinating. So deuterium depleted water. So you'll, you'll hear heavy water. That's deuter that's water with deuterium in it. And then light water is deuterium depleted water. And there are companies now figuring out how to make deuterium depleted water. I, I had a bottle a couple of weeks ago just because I wanted to see what it tastes like. And it tastes just like regular water. It's like 12 bucks a bottle though. Um, so it's, <laughs> and it's super so, light. You pick it up off yeah. the shelf and throw it across the room. It's, right. Weighs nothing. Exactly. Floats in the air like the astronaut totally. stations. Exactly. Just like you're in space. So it's, I, I think it's fascinating. I think this this could be another new frontier in, in cancer. And, and again, I don't think it comes down to buying a bunch of deuterium depleted water necessarily. I think it comes down to doing something like a plant rich ketogenic diet in many cases. Yeah. So. And chalk another one up for grass fed meat. Really? There you go. What can't it do? Special announcements. Hey, Brock, remember Han Solo? Of course I remember Han Solo. Coolest guy in all of the galaxy. Absolutely. Who was frozen forever in carbonite. Remember that? Well, not yeah. forever, but you remember that? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, for a long time. Anyways, so uh, you can get a yoga mat of Han Solo frozen in carbonite. Are you aware of this? I'm not. You just piqued my interest. I need it's, a yoga mat. It's actually really, really funny. That is nerdy and, good and it, times. Yeah. And uh, this company on it, they have like Captain America weight training plates. They've got kettlebells with gorillas and zombies on them. Mm. And they have this new thing. They have a whole bunch of new stuff. They even have Star Wars kettlebells. Uh, speaking of Han Solo. <laughs> But you can have, uh, literally, you can be just like Jabba the Hutt doing yoga on top of Han Solo <laughs> if you're messed up in the head and that gets you off. So, uh, anyways, <laughs> on it, on it is an amazing company. You and just described me perfectly, Jabba the Hutt doing <laughs> yoga. That's uh, that's my Belly. Twitter handle right there. Well, you can save 10% off <laughs> anything at on it. You go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash O-N-N-I-T. And uh, if you haven't yet finished your Christmas shopping, there you have it. Buy somebody uh, close to you their own Han Solo yoga mat. Christmas is coming. Yeah. Bengreenfieldfitness.com slash on it. Uh, and that, you don't need a code. That'll automatically knock 10% off. Awesome. Uh, this podcast is also brought to you by... Uh, light in your orifices uh in your, in your head case, holes your ear holes yeah your head holes uh your head i don't like the term head holes because it doesn't rule out nostrils hmm. or eye sockets yeah. or the or the mouth right these okay. things do not go in any of those orifices they go in your ears so uh the team over at this company called human charger uh has identified specific photosensitive proteins on the surface of your brain and they're very similar to those found in the retina of your eye. And they create very similar reactions as the retina in your eye when they get exposed to light. And so we're talking about increased energy levels and improved mood and increased mental alertness and reduced the effects of jet lag. Uh, they're kind of like they, they produce like this nice little cozy warmth when you put them in your ears too. Plus, it looks like you're just listening to an audio player. So people leave you the freak alone while you got the light in your ears antisocial and introverted mm -hmm. like I am mm -hmm. so anyways you, it's a calibrated white light that goes in your ears you plug it in uh, and you push a button and you do it for 12 minutes a day and it's it's amazing for jet lag and sleep and mental alertness and mood and everybody listening in gets 20% off you go to bengreenfieldfitness.com slash human charger and you enter code ben20 that's b-e-n-2-0 uh, for 20% off of the human charger hooray uh, and then finally Brock, do you like to brush your teeth or are you more of a toothpick gingivitis guy? I love flossing. I'm one of those weirdos that loves flossing. Yeah. I'll floss, mm -hmm. but not brush, but I'll never like brush it. and not floss. The strings get stuck in my teeth. That ever happened to you when you're flossing? No. Yeah, they get stuck in my teeth. What's I think I just you? have very tightly uh, packed together teeth. You don't, I don't know. You don't have any gaps. No, I don't. Well, I've got a little bit of a gap, but anyway. it's not bad. Uh, anyways, though, this company, 
has developed this electric toothbrush that looks like Apple and Tesla had a baby together and it was a toothbrush. That's basically <laughs> what it looks like. It's amazing looking what? toothbrush. It, it made Oprah's 2017 New Year's O list. It's won a GQ grooming award. It was named one of Time Magazine's best inventions, a freaking toothbrush. And it's very simple. Uh, it, it's called a Quip toothbrush and it's electric toothbrush and it and it vibrates and it has these special replaceable heads on it and uh, it like gives you cues like when to switch to a different part of your tooth, mm-hmm. uh, your teeth if you happen to have more than one. Uh, and it's a sleek design, and uh, it, they they send you these amazing bristles that are like these high end bristles that go along with your toothbrush, and uh, and it vibrates. Did I mention it so vibrates? It doesn't spin; it vibrates. Yeah, huh. exactly. Fun. So uh, everybody here can get one and get your first refill pack for free. Uh, at the following URL, getquip.com slash Ben. And quip is spelled Q-U-I-P. So getquip.com slash Ben. And you'll you'll be off to the to the toothbrushing races. So there you have it. What do you think? I love it. I, if I didn't have a very expensive toothbrush already, I would get one of those. Awesome. And then as usual, a whole bunch of new goodies over at uh, our new website, Keon. K-I-O-N, everything you need to optimize your mind, your body, and your spirit. Every single episode of the Ben Greenville Fitness Show is now brought to you by Keon, and you can get instant access to slamming deals, uh, coaching, content, community, products, everything that you need, again, to optimize not just your six-pack, but also your brain and your soul. Just go to uh, getkeon.com, G-E-T-K-I, K-I, like uh, key, life force, energy, getkeon.com. Yeah, don't go to keon.com because then you end up at some crazy German, uh, I don't know what they are, some kind of industrial complex. They're, con- they're a construction company, trust yeah. me, I know, because I asked them if I could buy their website and they asked me for a million dollars. So They yeah. said nine. So we're, we're getkeon.com, not keon.com. All right, let's talk about fat. Listener Q and A. My question is: How do I lose the weight in my midsection, my belly, from about January or February to about now? I've lost about fifteen pounds, but I still can't get rid of my belly fat. I've switched to a low carb, high fat diet. And it's helped, but um, I just can't seem to get rid of these last few pounds belly. And I was just wondering if you had any tips. Um, I'm relatively active. I play hockey three times a week, work out one or two other times during the week. Um, and I'm guessing it's mostly diet. I was just wondering if there was any supplements I could be taking, any blood tests I could be doing that would help to get rid of this belly fat. Thanks. Well, Patrick, I've got, I've got bad news for you. Uh-oh. You can't pill pop your way out of belly fat. Aww. You just can't pill pop your way out of belly fat. There are some things that can work a little bit for belly fat, but let's talk about fat, shall we, Brock? Yeah, why not? <laughs> Seeing as that's what we're All supposed right. to be talking about today, it is okay. the fat loss super special. Okay, so we've got belly fat specifically that Patrick has this question about. And uh, you really have two different types of fat, though. You have visceral fat and you have subcutaneous fat. Yep. Now, the, the problem is fat does not just store energy. Fat does not just store fat cells. No. Um, and this is not a problem, but it's a good thing. For example, yeah. fat secretes uh, leptin, which helps you to regulate hunger. That, that hormone comes from your fat. Uh, it also secretes uh, adiponectin, which also has a lot of health-promoting uh, properties. It, it secretes uh, something else called tumor necrosis factor alpha. That one's a bad one. Yeah, that, that one promotes no inflammation. Good. And you need some inflammation, obviously, to repair damaged tissue and you know deal with pathogens, but too much of it uh, does not do your body good. So uh, in terms of subcutaneous versus uh, visceral fat, um, the problem with, with visceral fat is it, it tends to result in, in more of this inflammation compared to, say, subcutaneous fat, which could even just be like brown fat or, or fat that is used to, say, keep you warm for insulation. 
and when you look at someone's belly, typically to know what kind of fat they have, if you're looking at your own belly, um, subcutaneous fat kind of folds around your around your navel, around your belly button. Uh, it's easier to to like reach down and pinch, and it tends to kind of shift around as you pinch it, and you can you can move it, and you can wiggle around. Whereas visceral fat is like the big old kind of beer belly type of look that that sticks out. Um, you remember the Simpsons and, episode when uh, when Homer went into the doctor and and they tested what kind of fat he had by just like slapping his belly and seeing how long it took for it to stop jiggling. Uh, no, I did not see this. Simpsons it was Osby just stood there going, look at that blubber fly. And it went for like a minute. Just oh, kept wow. jiggling. Now, Homer, this is a new body fat analysis test. I start you jiggling and measure how long it takes to stop. Woohoo! Look at that blubber fly. Yes. Nurse, cancel my one o'clock. So that would be visceral fat or subcutaneous? Pretty sure that would be visceral fat. Okay. Pretty sure that would be visceral. And and fat also comes in two types, white and brown. So we have brown fat, which is actually, it's a very good type of fat to have. And we usually find it in babies, and its main function is to produce heat. Uh, but actually, my boys and I were in San Francisco a few days ago, and we were, we were walking through San Francisco down on Fisherman's Wharf on a Sunday morning, and we saw all the polar bear swimmers out there. And some of them were coming out of the water. And some of these guys, you know, they, they were super fit, but they had this layer of fat. The fat, and, and one of my boys spoke up, and it was quite profound. He said, Dad, those guys are probably going to live a really long time, huh? Because <laughs> he saw them all out there swimming in the, in the cold water. And my, my children are aware of the link between like cold exposure and longevity. Uh, and the fact is, that's actually true because that thick layer of subcutaneous fat on these guys and, and gals, that's brown fat that basically burns calories to generate heat and produces very little like tumor necrosis, alpha factor, or any of these other inflammatory compounds. It's just something that is, is like a natural protective type of effect. You know, some people think a surplus of it is is viewed as as unattractive, but ultimately it's, you know, it's something that, that confers uh, health yeah. and longevity. It plays a role other than making your pants fit funny. Uh yeah, and a lot of subcutaneous fat can be brown fat, but visceral fat is it. You know, it's it's a whole different animal. Not only is it comprised of a, of a lot of white fat, and you need some of it, right? It surrounds and it cushions all your internal organs from jarring around. Uh, but too much of it, it, it's associated with with a ton of things. You know, heart disease and cancer and high blood pressure. I mean, even freaking dementia. Uh, and yeah, it's it's really really interesting. One of the reasons for that uh, revolves around what's what's called lipotoxicity. Lipotoxicity. So what this means is that enlarged visceral fat cells release fatty acids directly into your liver through what's called your portal vein, and then those fatty acids begin to accumulate in the pancreas, in the heart, and a bunch of other abdominal organs, and uh, those areas are not supposed to, in an ideal situation, store fatty acids until there's a big overflow of fatty acids. But once they begin to store them, you know, you've heard of like uh, fatty liver disease, for example, yeah, right? Yeah, that's no good. Yeah, so... So you get a much higher risk of liver problems or type 2 diabetes or, or heart disease or because of the gut-brain axis, you know, things like dementia. Uh, and visceral fat cells are also different from subcutaneous fat cells in other ways. So they have more receptor sites for cortisol, for example. Uh, and uh, because of that, you know, high levels of cortisol and also high levels of insulin, they have a lot of insulin receptor sites too, those promote even more visceral fat accumulation. And that's the very first clue for Paul, right? Like you, or, or for, for Patrick, you control your cortisol and your stress, you control your insulin, you know, via some of those things we talked about earlier, right? Like postprandial walks and, you know, eating a meal when you're in a glucose sensitive state. And that can prevent some formation of that classic beer belly visceral fat look. And, you know, the, the other interesting thing is that when it comes to visceral fat, cortisol and insulin will increase it and promote accumulation of visceral fat, but testosterone and growth hormone and even estrogens will have a little bit of an opposite effect, right? So, so doing things like, you know, adequate sleep to keep growth hormone elevated and uh, doing things that would maintain testosterone, such as sprinting and heavy weight training with your legs and, you know, good vitamin D and magnesium and zinc intake and uh, ensuring that you have adequate estrogens by taking care of, for example, uh, your liver, right? Using things like, you know, glutathione and some liver supporting antioxidants, things like that. 
all of those type of things can help out quite a bit when it comes to the formation of or, or fighting off the formation of visceral fat. In addition, there are some very basic things that you would expect to be associated with higher levels of visceral fat. For example, high glycemic index foods, right? Like I've had guys who have leftover belly fat. I'll tell them, get rid of sugar and starches, period. Yeah. Go strict. After a few months, it just disappears. Um, there's also a class of antioxidants known as catechins that can help to burn fat cells. And those would include things like green tea, uh, dark chocolate in moderation, red wine in moderation, uh, dark berries, which are great, you know, blueberries, things like that. Those apparently uh, have a little bit of an effect on visceral fat. Uh, they've also looked at what type of training has an effect on visceral fat. And it looks like uh, rather than doing just aerobic training and just resistance training, combining aerobic training with resistance training seems to have the best effect on visceral fat. Mm -hmm. So doing like concurrent training. And that would be in the same workout, right? So so you're doing like, let's say, uh, uh, one of my favorites would be like a superset where you're doing like a squat uh, to a deadlift to a sprint on a bike. And then you're doing a pull up to a push up, to a sprint on a treadmill. And then you're doing a low back extension to a hanging leg raise to a sprint on an elliptical, right? And you're just kind of going back and forth from resistance training to aerobic training. So that makes sense. Yeah. And we're not talking about a long sprint either. We're talking like 30 to 60 seconds of a sprint. Right. And, and we know that exercise in addition to cold helps to convert white fat into brown fat. And one of the reasons for that is there's this, this hormone called irisin that's associated with muscles. That, that is one of the main mechanisms for doing that, for turning white fat into brown fat. Um, sleep, there appears to be a link between sleep patterns and visceral fat, meaning getting adequate sleep is also uh, uh, a little bit of a, a silver bullet for visceral fat. Uh, and then uh, there was, of course, a question about this concept of uh, supplementation. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a whole lot when it comes to supplementation. I mentioned catechins. So, you know, I am a fan of green tea. In addition to, to people who want to lose weight quickly, uh, telling them not to eat sugar and starches because of what I just mentioned, I will also in many cases recommend people will do like a catechin rich, caffeine rich compound. Green tea is a perfect example. And then you go out and you exercise fasted in the morning at an aerobic rate. So it's not super stressful and you're not engaging in like compensatory eating afterwards, right? So a CrossFit wad, you're probably going to go eat a bunch of eggs and bacon afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, easy walk in the sunshine, your appetite doesn't spike so high. But you do some caffeine before, and then you finish that up with cold exposure, right? like a cold shower. And if I'm trying to get lean or if it's like, um, you know, let, let's say it, it's Christmas Day and you eat a whole bunch, I'll get up the next morning and I'll have a bunch of green tea and I'll go on a nice long walk and I'll come back and I'll take a cold shower. And that's great for keeping at bay a lot of these, these type of uh, visceral fat accumulation issues. And, and those catechins, especially in the green tea, have been shown to cause that. By the way, Brock, you know what? There was a research study that just came out yesterday, total total rabbit hole uh, on uh, antioxidant supplementation. Oh, and yeah. You know how we've all, we've all been taught that antioxidant supplementation in conjunction with exercise can blunt the fitness response to yeah, that yeah. exercise? Yeah. They've found that one specific type of antioxidant found in the epigallocatechins that you get from green tea is mm -hmm. uh, it, it results in decreased inflammation and a decreased oxidative response without blunting that uh, fitness response to exercise. Hmm. Isn't that fascinating? That's So crazy. it turns out you can take antioxidants after exercise. They just need to be the type of antioxidants you would find, for example, in green tea. Uh, I, gotta, so, I just don't yeah. like green tea, but the, all the evidence is just stacking up that I got to just get over it and start having Yeah, you got to have the good stuff. I have this guy who I, who I coach. He's a chef. He's a French-Japanese cuisine chef. And uh, he just sends me these bags of green tea because he goes to Japan a few times a year and harvests green tea in the mountains. And this, this green tea is like 200 bucks a bag. Yee. And it's just, it's amazing. You can just like it better chew be. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really <laughs> The real, green tea like, I have is free. So, they bring it to yeah, the table so in a plastic jug. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of spoiled. My green tea is really good. Okay. Um, okay. But anyway, so yeah. Anyway. Green tea, fasted stay with some, with some cold afterwards. Uh, that, that's another thing that can help. So we were talking about supplements. And, you know, anything with like a green tea type of extract or caffeine is a close second. Could help out a little bit. Um, but ultimately like movement in a fasted state and some of those other techniques I talked about earlier, like sleep, insulin regulation, avoiding high glycemic foods, et cetera, 
that is a much, much bigger effect. So we do know, however, that exercise and movement and exposure to cold, especially in a fasted state with green tea or caffeine in your system, appears to be pretty potent for, for visceral fat. Uh, and then finally, like I mentioned, you know, do do your your cardio and your weight training, but try and do it at the same time from a from an activity standpoint. And then I guess if there was one other thing you could look into, it'd be yohimbe oh. or, or yohimbe. Now uh, that blocks the activity of alpha receptors in fat cells, so technically it could cause you to reduce your visceral fat stores uh, more quickly. The problem is that because it's such a potent central nervous system stimulant, I am remiss to to recommend it that heavily because I, I always hate to tell, you know, like green tea and caffeine are one thing, but Yohimbi, at least in me, I don't know if you've used it much, but it makes me feel like I'm going to have a heart attack if I go out and exercise. Yeah, yeah it makes me stuff. super jittery. Yeah, super yeah. It's like, it, so anything that that's an excessive central nervous stimulant like that, I would be careful with, but I mean, you you can get Yohimbi on on Amazon, for example, and um, you know, I'll, I'll, I can put a link in the show notes if if you want to just support the show and go to Amazon and buy yourself some Yohimbi and, and go out and and um, uh, uh, spasm around during your exercise session while <laughs> clutching your hand to your chest. Uh, but otherwise, you know, I, I like more natural uh, fat loss support supplements like uh, Keon. I mentioned earlier we have this this new one called Keon Lean. That literally just, uh, you know, it lowers your blood sugar and improves your uh, blood glucose response, but doesn't actually have any type of central nervous system effects. So that's a perfect example of, uh, of something that I think more naturally, you know, kind of like Ceylon cinnamon or mm. apple cider vinegar or something like that. Very, mm. very similar type of effect. So I would, I would go after something that stabilizes blood sugar more than something that stimulates the central nervous system. So... You know, there you have it. Since we talked about s- brown fat so much and cold exposure, we should really mention, I know we just got a brand new discount code for the cool fat burner vest. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. The, if tell, you go to, tell me about it. If you go to coolfatburner.com and use the code BEN15CFB, which I guess stands for cool fat burner, you can get 15% off one of those awesome uh vests there it's sort of a vest i suppose it kind of resembles a vest and then yeah. the cummerbund no, that also comes yeah with i've it. used it some of my clients use it too like a lot of my clients who have to work during the day and yeah. can't just like spend all their time in a pool uh they'll put the the vest on they also have like one that goes around your waist and it, and it triggers triggers shivering in those areas and so you get the conversion of the white cells into the brown cells that's a good point i didn't think of that um so that'd be another option is just wear some of this cooling gear uh, for example, around your belly fat. And it sounds kind of gimmicky, um, but there's some very, very compelling research behind that. I think they've got a lot of it kind of published over at that Cool Fat Burner website. So that's a good deal, too. Um, can we put that code in the show notes for people, Brock? Let's do it. Yeah, they, for sure. They want. Okay, so go to yeah. bengreedfulfitness.com slash 376 and get yourself a, a sexy piece of Cool Fat Burning gear. Okay, so the rest of the questions, sadly, people asked them very nicely on Facebook, but they totally ignored our pleas to go over to SpeakPipe and leave them as audio questions. So now you're stuck with me reading them to you instead of your lovely voices being on the podcast. So uh, I like it when people read to me. Okay, well, Gail wrote, does DIM help with fat loss? And (laughs) DIM stands for (laughs) <laughs> diendolylmethane diendolylmethane do you know how to say that mm-hmm. i do but i'm i'm highly entertained by listening to you try diendolyl yeah. diendolylmethane you got it oh nice nailed it <laughs> kind of <laughs> <laughs> after 17 so, tries so what's the question how <laughs> does it help with fat loss okay I'm not uh, gonna try and say it again, so I'm going to call it. Uh, it. Yeah, uh, method. That that just it. You, you find it in broccoli, for example, mm. and it's called diendol methane because it's just two indole groups that are attached to a methane group. So there you go, chemistry one on one. There you go. Uh, it's got a lot of promise for lowering estrogen, uh, especially like you know, like guys who get man boobs and stuff like that, uh, or in women who have estrogen dominance. Uh, I got a lot of promise also when it comes to some of its potential to limit the growth of tumors. So, hmm. you know, that's why we hear a lot about like broccoli and sulforaphane. A lot of these things have a potential anti 
carcinogenic effects. That's why you're supposed to eat your broccoli and your cauliflower and your Brussels sprouts and all your cruciferous veggies, right? So uh, when it comes to fat loss, uh, which is one thing that it's marketed for, um, there, there's one study where they use this this stuff, this indole three carbonyl, very similar to diendol methane or di di. Yeah, <laughs> I reckon di in methane, uh, DIM. Let's call it from here on yes, out. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> they found that that uh, it was able to attenuate uh, expected gain in body fat associated with a high fat, high calorie diet. Speaking of binging. Mm -hmm. uh, however, they were doing five milligram injections into the gut. And the last time I checked, you couldn't waltz into Walgreens and buy a needle chock full of, of this, uh, DIM. So ultimately that's one of, this is one of those examples where, you know, what's in a laboratory study might not really be something you could replicate in real life. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, if you want to inject it into your gut after you <laughs> eat too much, I suppose that. That could help. Wait, so just like right in, right into your gut, like you'd have to actually like stick it through your skin into you, like and actually penetrate your your gut wall. Well, I don't know if they injected it subcutaneously or not. I could probably find the study, and I, I think it was in mice too. I guess either way, it's a little much. Here, anti obesity so study in 2011 in the Journal of Nutrition: Anti obesity activities of indole three carbonyl and high fat diet induced obese mice. And uh, I, I don't have the methods in front of me in mm -hmm. terms of the actual study methods, but I do know that they injected into the adipose tissue region of those mice. And okay. I would imagine right. if they were mice, it's probably like subcutaneous. Um, it could have been straight into the into the. I usually you don't do needles straight into the gut just because no. of the obvious the obvious potential issues. Usually it's subcutaneous. Talk about leaky was, gut. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> uh, you don't want needles in your gut. So ultimately, um, yeah. So it, it because it has this aromatase inhibiting activity, uh, and and because estrogen dominance in women, especially often postmenopausal women who produce less progesterone, and in men who may be experiencing man boobs or highly estrogenic activity. Um, due to let, let's say you know, like a guy who's on testosterone who's like taking a lot of that testosterone and metabolizing it into estrogen for example you know those, those are the type of people who who might benefit from better estrogen metabolism and so indirectly because estrogen can cause some storage of calories or store you know generation of fat cells to store calories mm -hmm. um it may have an indirect effect on fat loss if you have estrogen dominance but otherwise Unlikely that that would work. One thing I wanted to mention, though, with, with um, wouldn't buy DIM, which is DIM, which is what you're going to get at most places. I would actually purchase it as indole three carbonyl. Uh, it, it's actually uh, more bioavailable and it acts a little bit better, especially when it comes to liver detoxification and estrogen metabolism. Uh, and indole three carbonyl is absorbed in your small intestines and converted into DIM. And so uh, for something like that, uh, they found that dosages should be somewhere in the range of about 400 milligrams a few times a day. So right around you know, 1,000 to 1,500 milligrams or so total taken a few times during the day. It's also great after a night of drinking to cleanse out the liver a little bit. So there you have it. You can get rid of your, get rid of your man boobs and your sore liver all at the same time. Um, sore so yeah, liver. I'll... Uh, Thorn has a good indole three carbonyl. Uh, I, I can link to it in the show notes for folks. But ultimately, I, you know, again, like I, I would come at fat loss primarily from from an activity, fasting, cold exposure type of standpoint. Lots of walking after, you know, heavy lifting before meals, and then things to control blood sugar like Ceylon cinnamon and apple cider vinegar and like that uh, the bitter melon extract stuff that I talked about, or potentially, you know, based on that study I cited in in the, our opening. Uh, something that has ashwagandha in it as a natural metformin alternative. Cool. Okay. Well, that leads us to our next question. And it's a question from Christian. Christian wrote on Facebook, what are your thoughts on the Kevin Hall study and whether keto has a metabolic advantage in the fat loss department? Are you familiar with this Kevin Hall study? <laughs> Who's not? Everybody, everybody knows Kevin. Everybody. No? Kevin Hall. Uh, yeah. 
there there's a whole video that he shot on the internet and I can I can link to it but basically there was a study uh, it was last year uh, so it's relatively recent and the study was called energy expenditure and body composition changes after an isocaloric ketogenic diet in overweight and obese men isocaloric I love the names of studies man yeah <laughs> isocaloric so all that all that means is that they they took a, a ketogenic <laughs> diet that had the same number of calories as a non ketogenic diet. And they, mm. they had like seventeen guys, and they they put them on either the high carb diet and the same number of calories on a ketogenic diet. And they studied what happened when it came to like fat loss and elevation of metabolism and, and all these other things. So, um, so basically, uh, the idea is that according to the conventional calories in calories out model of fat loss obesity or being overweight or fat gain is just that's a result of a simple mismatch between your calorie intake and your calorie expenditure yeah. so calories in calories out so just eat less and move more yep right and so this study was going to look at okay well is that true or does it really matter like what the source of those calories actually is whether it's from from carbohydrates or whether it's from from fat so uh that's basically called the carbohydrate insulin model, and that it's it's a totally different way of thinking, but it hypothesizes that excessive weight gain occurs because fat cells have been triggered to take up and store too many calories, uh, and that leaves too few calories available for the rest of the body, and so we overeat in an effort to keep enough calories in the bloodstream for the brain and the muscles and the other vital organs and those extra calories ultimately wind up in fat cells, creating this vicious cycle of hunger and overeating and weight gain. And so according to that hypothesis, overeating is a consequence and not a cause of some kind of an underlying metabolic problem mm. that triggers fat cells into like calorie storage overdrive. And the idea is that the thing that's able to do that is something we've already mentioned on the show, insulin, mm -hmm. you know, which would primarily come from either a ton of insulinogenic protein and dairy or else fast digesting processed carbohydrates like white bread and white rice and cereal and crackers and cookies and, and soda. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, th and there are some studies that, that provide a, a pretty good evidence for that, that calorie insulin model. Uh, for example, they, they had a study that showed that insulin therapy in people with diabetes and insulin administration in animal models can predictably cause weight gain, whereas insulin deficiency uh, very significantly can cause weight loss. Um, they've shown in animal studies that where animals are given a fast versus a slow digesting carbohydrate, that the animals who are given the fast digesting carbohydrate, they take in more calories and they gain excessive weight. Uh, when, when you look at this isocalorically, like fast carb versus slow carb. Yeah. Um, we also know that in humans, the number of calories in the blood crashes and your stress hormones like cortisol associated with that visceral fat surges and your hunger increases when you take in a meal that is highly insulinogenic, uh, such as a higher carbohydrate meal versus a meal that's not. And we also know that, uh, the metabolic rate can actually go down. Another study showed this on a long term, low fat high carbohydrate diet compared to diets that were slightly higher in fat. So mm. th there's a lot of, of interesting studies that have looked into this, this insulin hypothesis. And so this Kevin Hall guy, Kevin Hall, uh, they tested this hypothesis that exchanging dietary carbohydrate for fat would uh, increase the energy expenditure and fat oxidation. And so they took these 17 guys and they measured how many calories they were eating. They measured how much fat they were burning. Uh, they had them on two pretty well-controlled diets, one at high carbohydrate, like 50%. The other group ate low carbohydrate, literally 5%. And they mm -hmm. did this for Yee. four weeks, for four weeks. That's it? And yeah, that's it. Hmm. So it wasn't, it wasn't super long. It's not like no. these guys were doing this for, for like half their lives or anything. So what they found was that the folks who uh, ate the, uh, the low-carbohydrate diet increased their total energy expenditure by, drumroll please, mm -hmm. approximately slightly over 50 calories per day mm -hmm. and also increased their sleeping energy expenditure by about 90 calories or so over, the, over an entire night of sleep. Mm -hmm. And so the total energy expenditure for an entire day, in some cases, was as high as 
uh, more than 150 calories uh, in terms of the extra energy expenditure from a low carb, high fat diet. So an energy gap of 100 to 150 calories a day. And what Kevin Hall uh, reported was that that could comprise potentially a pretty major component of like the obesity epidemic long term over the course of years and years, you know, having that extra 100 to 150 calories a day that the body is storing. But there are also some problems with his study. Like, for example, one big one was that the group that was eating the high carbohydrate diet, um, they came in actually weighing a little bit less anyways, Hmm. which means that because we know that the more that you weigh, the higher your metabolic rate is, yeah. that it's possible that their metabolic rate was a little bit lower anyways to start with. So, mm-hmm. and that could, that could easily carry over to that, uh, that, that, you know, 150 calories per day. potentially. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 150 calories, 140 calories, whatever it was, is not significant. It's not insignificant, but it's not like blowing my mind. I got to say. Mm hmm. Yep. Exactly. So uh, also, they they uh, were not the participants, the participants of the study, they weren't in calorie balance. So they lost weight and fat through the study. And so, you know, it, it, it's, it's really difficult to say, you know, if they're going to be losing weight anyways, once we return to this genetic factor that we talked about with those twins, how much variability there would be just based on genetics as well and, and how much of a confounding variable that might be. Yeah. There's, there's just all, you know, I was just down in San Francisco and I interviewed this gal named Dr. Daphne Miller and we talked about how she'll put like uh, Mexicans who have diabetes in America on a traditional Taramahara Indian tribe diet and they'll yeah. lose weight when eating more maize and corn and, and tortillas and, and beans. Whereas she'll put like, you know, people who are from a Northern European population she'll recommend sometimes like higher fish oil intake or you know fermented food intake or omega-3 intake she recommends lots of fiber and fermented foods for people who are of african-american descent so ultimately uh, any any study like this these days i'm like eh, yeah, it's probably better not to eat a lot of sugar yeah and process carbohydrates but ultimately you need to eat the diet that corresponds best to your ancestry best to your genetics and even best to your locale yeah. Right. Because if you think about it, we live in a genetic melting pot in America. And so, you know, for, for me, yeah, my kids are based on moms and mine genetics, kind of northern European. But we're surrounded by what we're surrounded by right here in the inland northwest in Spokane, Washington. Meaning if you walk out in my backyard, you're going to find um, – deer and turkey and quail and elk and you're going to find wild nettle and wild mint and dandelion and morel mushrooms and you're going to find like some lichen growing on the trees and you're going to find uh you know in terms of like a like stimulants like a, l- a little bit of camellia sinensis which is similar to like a a green tea type of leaf and you're going to find for the gut things like organ grape root extract and I'm a fan of this concept that if you know, you know, a handful of around a dozen different plants and herbs in your specific area, you can you can heal and fix just about anything. And if you eat uh, the the diversity of plants and animals that are around you in your specific locale, you'll support your own microbiome, and you will, as your family and your children and your children's children kind of grow up in that environment, almost change your own. Uh, genetics and your genetic expression to kind of match what it is that's local to where you're eating. I know it's a very kind of like long-term thinking kind of approach, but ultimately, you know, even if we were, you know, let's say we were like Korean or African American or, you know, something like that, like I'd still probably have a similar approach. I wouldn't say, okay, kids, let's order in and burn a bunch of jet fuel, you know, coconut milk and avocados and papaya and mango because we're we're African, right? Or that's where our roots are. I'd say let's start to, to to change up our genetics, begin to eat everything that's local that's here around us and come at things from that standpoint. So I think it's this this kind of weird art and science blend of paying attention to, to your genetics, but also like eating just like the local real food that's around you. More and more evidence is pointing towards that than having these one size fits all diets out there. Like more and more evidence is swaying, at least my opinion, to to completely agree with what you're saying. That just you got to eat for for you, and that could be completely different than than what your ancestors ate. But it also might be right in line. 
And now to throw a whole wrench in that equation, okay. let's talk about what happens when your genetics do change. Because I think our final question is about that, right? Uh, well, I'll read it and find out. Okay. Uh, okay, our next question is from Terry. And Terry wrote, Apple 4 carriers supposedly cannot use fat efficiently in ketosis. Thoughts? Mm. Scientific evidence? Those question, question mark, question there. mark, question yeah. mark. <laughs> uh, Apo, Apo, yes. Apo, not a fruit. It's a gene. Apo E. Uh, it stands for apple lipoprotein E. That's a key player in fat metabolism, or what they that, call in the science. The same thing as Apo 4? Lipid metabolism. Um, well, Apo E comes in three variants. You got Apo E2, Apo E3, and Apo E4. Ah. Right? And since you have two copies of every gene, you have you can have Apo E22, Apo E23, Apo E24, Apo E33. What am I missing? Please Apo continue. E, Apo E34 <laughs> and Apo E44, right? So there'd be, yeah, there'd be six. So there's two copies of each gene and there's three variants. You'd have six total possibilities. Right? Tune in and next so, week when Ben <laughs> does uh, right. algebra for I, us. I did take logic. So this Apo E4, uh, like that would be the one that could be an issue, especially the Apo E44. It's actually famous for its association with a significantly higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. But a lot of other diseases have been linked to it, like dementia and cardiovascular disease, for example. And you'll find like the Apo E34 or the 44 variant present in about 20% of folks in, in America, for example. And uh, when you have one or even more significantly two copies, like if you're Apo E34 or more significantly Apo E44, there are some issues. For example, uh, consumerating or consumerating. I just <laughs> made up that word. I like it. Nu- nucleating, uh, consumerating, consuming a uh, high intake of saturated fatty acids that can significantly raise your LDL particle count, which is a major risk factor in uh, your cholesterol profile for cardiovascular disease. It can significantly raise C-reactive protein, which is another inflammatory risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It can uh, substantially raise your LDL cholesterol, which is not correlated with cardiovascular disease. However, if you constantly test your LDL and you're finding you're like in the 300s and the 400s, you may want to get your genetics checked out to see if you you have this copy. Um, Now, in addition, you'll also find that when you consume monounsaturated fatty acids uh, and you have that that variant, that can actually have some of the opposite effects, right? More of a Mediterranean diet can actually have more of a cardioprotective effect when you have this specific genetic variant. Uh, And uh, in addition, when you consume a high amount of omega-6 fatty acids, it appears to be more deleterious, right? Like lots of what's called EPA uh, or arachidonic acid from nuts and nut butters and seeds and stuff like that. That might actually be more of an issue for people who carry this ApoE4 gene than people who don't. Uh, In addition, alcohol seems to cause a significant increase in triglycerides in these folks uh, without the same cardioprotective effect as we see in other People who drink alcohol and get a cardioprotective effect doesn't happen when you have the mm. ApoE34. You get impaired heavy metal detox capability. So you can tend to be higher in lead, higher in mercury. Uh, you have increased susceptibility to the detrimental effects of a sedentary lifestyle, meaning it's more important for people with these genetic variants, the, the Apo34 or 44, to exercise compared to others. And like I mentioned, a substantially higher risk of, of Alzheimer's disease. So um, so based on this, when it comes to risk management for this Apple E34, Apple E44 diet, number one would be because consuming saturated fatty acids can substantially raise the risk of cardiovascular disease, like the whole coconut manna, coconut butter, grass-fed butter, you know, ketogenic type of approach is not a very good approach for people who happen to have this variant, in my opinion. And something more like a very plant-rich approach that's slightly higher in carbohydrates from healthy sources like tubers, for example, right? Like uh, parsnips and beets and sweet potatoes and yams and, yeah, pumpkin, which I love. Me too. I bake pumpkins almost every night these days and eat them because we have a ton of pumpkins around. I bake a pumpkin with some avocado oil and some sea salt. And then when that comes out, I'll put like a little bit of a little bit of yogurt on there and, you know, a handful of fennel seeds and some nut butter. And like, I'll just eat like literally like a whole pumpkin for dinner. That's what I had for dinner last night was a whole pumpkin with some arugula salad inside. Yeah. 
I'm going to do um, pumpkin with a rabbit tonight. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, exactly. So you avoid palm oil. You avoid coconut oil. You avoid coconut milk. You don't do the butter. You don't do the ghee, no matter how much that diet seems to be helping your neighbor lose weight. You're very careful with nuts. Uh, almonds are pretty low in saturated fatty acids. So those would be one that that's you know pretty good. Uh, dark chocolate is, is pretty high in saturated fats. That's another one you got to avoid. You got to be careful with lots of animal meat, especially fatty animal meats like bacon. So, you know, if you're a crossfitter with the APOE 3444, you should not be doing the eggs and bacon uh, when you go out for breakfast after the wad, right? Be hmm. taking the, the green smoothie. Bummer. Um, and you, uh, you even need to be careful, uh, you know, with those wonderful nuts and nut butters and seed butters. Uh, and instead go after uh, what would be called MUFAs, monounsaturated fatty acids like avocados and olive oil and low glycemic index carbohydrates, not just the tubers I mentioned, but also like lentils and properly you know, soaked and fermented beans, things along those lines. So, um, so yeah, I will, I'll put a helpful link in the show notes for you with pretty much everything you'd ever need to know about uh, APOE4, but ultimately, uh, you know, to answer the question um yeah i'm not a fan of a ketogenic diet if you happen to have that gene and, and that could be up to 20 possibly as high as 20 percent of people uh, when it comes to that so yeah you know so what? that's where i'm at on that that's me i've got that gene Do you? yeah yeah and i uh my cholesterol was through the freaking roof when i was following what uh what would be a much higher fat diet and sort of doing things like mct oils and butters and everything like that and uh, they wanted to put me on statins and I was like, nah, I think I, I think I know what to do. And within like four months, I had everything back under control just by doing exactly what you said. It's crazy. How long ago was that? Uh, about a year. Wow. Wow. Actually, I wrote to you about it and you were the one who, uh, who got me pointed in the right direction. So well, I never again, get any other you. emails. So my apologies. For, yeah. Uh, Bring that. I was mixed in with what two or three other emails that day. Probably. Hey, dude, you didn't want to see my email inbox. It's, I do it's not. Crazy. You're right. Yeah. It I makes me sweat. Get, I get like probably, I don't know. I, I would estimate maybe 75 an hour. Something like that. Yeah, it's a lot. And I mean, not like 75 junk, like 75, like you need to respond to this. I would like that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. I'm literally hiring a full-time person just to be in my email inbox basically. So Ugh. don't, don't email me about your anal hemorrhoids unless you're okay with other people seeing that. Folks. There you go. <laughs> um, the, that's the, speaking of anal the hemorrhoids, should we give something away? <laughs> Not anal hemorrhoids. Don't All give right. those away. Keep them to yourself. So this this is the part of the show where we give a special goodie to a listener, such as yourself. Uh, and if you leave a review in iTunes and uh, you hear it read on the show, then we will send a handy dandy gear pack your way. All you need to do is email gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. That's gear at greenfieldfitnesssystems.com. Let us know your t-shirt size, and we'll put a gift pack with a BPA-free water bottle and a sweet Ben Greenfield Fitness beanie and or a Ben Greenfield tube, Fitness I like tech, tech t-shirt. Maybe that's uh, just because my head is so freaking big, but it's really maybe. tight. It's yeah. really tight. All right. Well, anyway, you've got the yeah. big head, so why don't you take this one away? Okay. This one's from Motor City Fitness. I like that. Um, okay. It goes like this. I have been listening to Ben for about two years now. I work construction full time and with my passion for fitness, I've found Ben's podcast to be the perfect health podcast to listen to while I work throughout the day. As I build things with my hands, Ben helps build my brain, guiding me through topics. I am completely unfamiliar with Ben opens my mind to new and exciting modalities and research in the health and fitness sphere. Truly. An amazing podcast from a, oh, seriously? From a grounded, successful expert? <laughs> He's grounded. calling you grounded? Grounded. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Yes. Uh, I'm barefoot. Oh, yeah. That kind of grounded. Sure. Uh, from a grounded, successful expert who unturns a new rock in each episode. Wait, you unturn? Unturn. So I think, you, you put it back? I think that's what, yeah. Be? Yeah, I put the rocks back where there's the rocks to back. Be. That's good. Okay. Motor That's City City Fitness, uh, Motor City Fitness needs to work on on his uh, on his uh, semantics, but the actual semantics vernacular vernacular. Grammar. I don't know. Grammar. I'm losing my words. Verbiage. Anyways, though, Motor City Fitness. Thanks for the amazing review. And 
email us. The Perfect us. Health Podcast to listen no. to while I work. Perfect. Um, all right, folks. Well, we'll put links to everything over at bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 376, uh, the article on deuterium depleted water and all the mm-hmm. research studies on walking, mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. ketosis, I love that one. Uh, diets for ApoE4, uh, the best way to lose belly fat, and much more. So check it out. bengreenfieldfitness.com slash 376. Brock, I think it's time for root beer float. Oh, yes. Yes. Here I go. You've been listening to the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast. Go to bengreenfieldfitness.com for even more cutting-edge fitness and performance advice. 